Um, for our closing keynote address, I'm really honored to invite Mr. Mr. Seyun Sukduang, um, CEO and President of um, NG Resources. Seyun um, has been a member of the North America Executive Committee since 2013 and with NG since 2000. Prior to, prior to becoming President and CEO, Seyun managed the NG teams and companies responsible for implementation of all major capital infrastructure projects in the United States, Mexico, and Canada. He previously had executive level roles in, in, in mergers and acquisitions, business development, uh, and operations. And earlier in his career, asset management, finance, commodity risk management, and engineering. So much. Um, prior to joining NG, Sayun worked for um, Florida Power and Lights and regulated en in the regulated energy business. He holds a degree in engineering from the United States Merchant Marine Academy and Master of Business Administration from Fuqua. So, without further ado, thank you so much, Sayun, for being here. And um, please, uh, please, uh, please join me in having uh, um, on the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Yohai. So I have the unenviable task, as Liz and Yohai asked me to do, is stitch together just about everything you heard today into a strategy, and how do you operationalize it? That's my role at Energy, at NG. And I think as we talk through the next 15 minutes, you'll see that we've made some very bold moves given the prolific changes that we all heard. I think the only thing I want to address is how do you tackle solar beer? That was a new one for me. <laughs> so let me step back and tell you who I used to work for. And this was 24 months ago. I work for a company called GDF Suez. The best way to describe that is a European utility and a global independent power producer. 110,000 megawatts of power generation globally, gas infrastructure, trading, liquefied natural gas transportation. That was 24 months ago. Today, I work for a company called Engie. Same company. Very different mission to operationalize a very different vision. And the vision is very aligned with a lot of what we call the revolution in energy that you heard throughout the morning and the afternoon. How would I synthesize what we heard? It's three things. We call it the three Ds a move towards decentralization, the need for decarbonization, and the proliferation of digitization. If you take everything you heard today, those three Ds are at its core. So what are we doing? At Engie in North America, looking at many of the factors discussed in the first session by Brad about the growth of GDP and the anemic growth of the need for energy as a result of our economy growing. Looking at that one element and looking at who we were now 12 months ago, so just 12 months ago, I would characterize our North American business, and this is a made-up word, hopefully some of you have heard it before, but likely not. We were a Gen Taylor, a generation company that also sold retail electricity. Now there are many machinations of that in our industry. To navigate that vernacular, we have Gen Taylors, we have IPPs, independent power producers, that are primarily generation companies. We have hybrids, investor-owned utilities, that also own 
IPPs, hybrids. We have hybrid gen tailors. Exelon owns Constellation. Constellation has retail. All those different machinations exist in our industry. We looked at ourselves and said, we are a generation retail company. What do we need to do strategically and operationally given how energy is changing? Step one, October of last year and February of this year. We made what I think is our boldest move in our entire company worldwide. We sold almost all of our generation assets. And that was the foundation of our business. We had a billion dollars of EBITDA. We had the equivalent of a market cap if we were publicly traded in North America of about eight billion. And that was primarily in the infrastructure we own, those power plants we own, and we sold them. That substantially shrunk our company financially and from an employee perspective. Now let me step back and tell you a bit why we took that step. Put aside the fact that we already discussed GDP growth does not translate to the need for energy infrastructure growth and providing to our investors a fair rate of return when our industry is growing at less than GDP is a tough task in and of itself. I put that to the side. The main thing is we had to think about the incongruent nature of that business. How do you invest in energy infrastructure? I put it pretty simply. We sit there around our board table and we look at all the different markets in North America and wait for supply and demand to get tight. There are many different market constructs in our region, from capacity markets to energy-only markets, but they all fundamentally expose themselves when supply and demand get tight in either high price volatility or high capacity payments. And when we see that, we say, Great. Society needs us. We're an infrastructure company. We build things that they want right now. And we leveraged our global relationships in the ability to finance, construct, procure, operate, to deliver to society what they needed at that moment in time, which was another power plant. But did they really need it? We saw a presentation a bit earlier that said that generation capacity that peak capacity, when supply and demand gets tight, only operates 6% of the time. So did society really need what we do? My answer is no. And it was right in our face for the better part of a decade and a half where that's what I focused on was building that infrastructure. Why? Because we didn't make money at it, to be honest. You look at any IPP, you look at any hybrid that owns an IPP, look at their stock, look at their book value. There was a lot of commentary today about it's $700 a kilowatt to build a plant, $600 a kilowatt to build a plant. Look at the equity and enterprise values of those companies that own that infrastructure. It's a fraction of what it costs to build. So I say society doesn't need that. So we sold it. All chips on the table. What are we doing now? What do you do when you sell $5 billion worth of power plants the next morning. Well, you look at reinvesting it in many of the areas we talked about today. So I want to step back even further and give an analogy about infrastructure. Our headquarters in North America is in Houston. 
And Houston was once very famous for having the widest highway in the world. It no longer has that infamy. But that highway is 26 lanes wide at its widest point. I don't know if anybody's been on it. It's Interstate 10. And the posted speed on that highway, 60 miles per hour. And we all know where I'm going with this. Inevitably, two, four, six times a day, you go 10 to 30 miles per hour. And I say, look, we have a way to fix that. We have the technology. We know what concrete is. We know what rebar is. We have bulldozers. We know how to permit. We can fix this problem. Let's make it 100 lanes wide. And we'll go 60 miles per hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But at 2 in the afternoon, we as society would look at that and say, what did we do? It's not being utilized. The capital waste, the environmental impact of creating something that allows us to travel 60 miles per hour all the time. Where am I going with this story? Plug in to any outlet right now. What will you get? 60 hertz. Plug in at the hottest day, the coldest day, 2 in the morning, 2 in the afternoon, you will get 60 hertz. You won't even get 59.98. How did we do that? How did society make that happen? Behind these outlets is the equivalent of that 100-lane highway. Yet you don't see it. In my previous life, we looked to permit power plants where nobody knew where they were, where they were out of sight, out of mind. Transmission lines, out of sight, out of mind. And whenever we saw 59.98 hertz, the price of power would spike and we'd need more. And it's no different than as soon as you go, 59.9 miles per hour, we'll get a bulldozer out some concrete trucks, and add a lane. That's what everybody in this room has been promoting since the invention of the grid. That's why we sold our power plants. That's why we believe in a very different energy future. Now let's talk about what's next. Let's stick with the highway. It's not imaginable now that technology around transportation evolves so rapidly that cars can communicate with each other and step forward. When they're even smarter, do we need lanes? Do we need lights, traffic lights? Do we need direction of travel? Could fish, excuse me, could cars move in the future like fish swim in schools today? It's not hard to imagine. If so, could that 26 lane highway be enough capacity already for the next century? Maybe even too much capacity for the next century. And how could society reinvest its intellectual capital, its financial capital, in something else other than building highways? Guess what? Electrons already move like fish swim. Could you apply that equation, that narrative, to energy and create value? That's what we are pursuing. We're pursuing engaging in energy as a service, leveraging the three Ds, 
the fact that society wants to pursue a sovereignty around energy to make sure that the cost is fair, the environmental impact is as little as it can be, and that security of supply is as stable as you have today. And can you engage in battery technology, in demand response, in thermostats, in energy efficiency, in data insights, and apply them to the knowledge of how the grid operates today to the fringes of the grid and significantly optimize the existing infrastructure we in this room have already invested in. Let's take some more analogies. $700 a kilowatt was used as the cost to build a power plant. I'm going to round up to 1,000 to make the math easier. The average power plant, 1,000 megawatts at $1,000 a kilowatt is a billion dollars to build. And let's say that includes the pipeline to feed the gas, the transmission line to evacuate the power, and the plant itself. And a 1,000 megawatt plant, taking the state of Texas as an example, feeds about the peak demand of 600,000 houses. And it feeds that peak demand for that 6% of the year, if that. We talked about the Nest thermostat. You can go buy one today for $200. You can put them in 600,000 houses. That's $120 million. And we all know, and in fact, right now, I'm a bit chilly. I could live with a half degree temperature change. I could live with a degree temperature change. To save the difference 6% of the time between that societal investment of $1 billion in that power plant versus the societal investment of 120. $880 million in just that one example of savings by thinking about energy differently. Let's take the highway a bit further. <clears throat> Self-driving cars, highway capacity. Think about parking. When the cars can drive themselves, think about what society spent on parking. And I love this stat, it came from another university, that the average person in the United States has eight parking spaces available to him or her at any point in time. Home, school, office, shopping, restaurant. And the average cost to build a parking space is about $10,000. As above ground, below ground, surface, $10,000. I have an eight-year-old. My eight-year-old owns $80,000 of parking. Society invested in that. Imagine what we could do if we harness that money differently. Let's take that back to energy. We all have freezers. We buy freezers to preserve food. I'd be I'm not going to ask because it's a smart group of people, but I'd be amazed if somebody in this room could tell me the temperature they keep their freezer other than below freezing. <laughs> and I'm willing to bet you do not care if your freezer is 30 degrees or 28 or 22. The only repercussion of your freezer being too cold is if at 2 in the morning you want to scoop some ice cream, it might hurt your wrist. That's the only repercussion. But can you repurpose that freezer beyond preserving food to help orchestrate a more efficient grid? Could we turn it down to 20 degrees at 2 in the morning and make sure that that compressor is never on the highway at 7 in the morning 
when everybody wants to turn on their lights, run the toaster. Yes, all the technology exists to do that. But we just haven't engaged in the right narratives to help deliver what we feel and our investment thesis is based on investing in outcomes. And it's going to happen more and more. Energy as a service is just as I'm describing, delivering you the outcomes you want. And the outcome you want was never, I want a kilowatt hour. You never woke up in the morning and said, give me some of those. I love them. <laughs> but you always wake up saying, I'm too warm. I'm too cold. I need light. I want my phone to work. That's what you want. And how do we engage society around the outcomes in the most efficient way? Go back to the beginning of the grid. The grid wasn't about selling kilowatt hours. Thomas Edison, he sold light bulbs. The grid was a necessary element to sell light. How we turned it into something to sell kilowatt hours is an incongruent thing that we need to challenge. So what have we done? We've started to invest and grow our business back up to the size we were before we sold our power generation fleet. And in a matter of under 18 months, the assets have been sold. It brought us from approximately 2,000 employees down to 1,000. Today, in North America, we sit at 4,000 employees. We've invested in both traditional, product-centric energy companies, energy efficiency companies, lighting, heating, facility management companies that help orchestrate what you're experiencing today from both a climate control and light perspective, and also in newer product-centered energy companies like solar, wind, battery. And we're combining those businesses with what is an emerging part of our industry, energy insight companies, data companies. We saw some of that on the stage today. How do we consume? How do we orchestrate? How do we use? And our business model is focused on how do we take traditional product-centered energy companies and new energy insight companies, bring them together to deliver the outcome that you want at the lowest cost, least environmental impact, and at a grid stability level that is equal to what we experience today. So with that, I'll invite Dr. Vermeer up to tension that claim and open it up to questions. Thanks for your time. I'm sitting here. You go ahead and have a seat. Great. Can you all hear me OK? Excellent. Good. Well, let's, um, let's dig in. That was a great introduction. And I, I was just taking notes over the course of today. Um, what are some of the highlights that we've heard over the course of the conversations? And Cyan mentioned several of, uh, of these declining loads, breakthrough technologies, a focus on customers, delivering energy service, disruptive innovation. I think we have a great case study of so many of the themes that we taught today built into one business model and an experiment that Cyan is leading with NG that I think uh, is very bold in sort of wrapping together these kind of new trends into a model of what energy uh, companies might look like in the future. Um, when Sina and I talked uh, several months ago, 
in the first couple of minutes, I was really intrigued by a company that was taking such bold moves to capture sort of the implication of these new technologies, these new opportunities, and take their business in a completely different way. Um, but I'd like to start with uh, a personal question, which is, you know, when we got to know each other, you described yourself as an infrastructure guy. You grew up as an infrastructure guy, and that's kind of where most of your career has been. How did you get to the point now of leading a company in this uh, really bold move toward uh, customer-centric or energy services? So first I want to note the color of my socks. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I think they're kind of uh, hopefully a little bit bold, like the last uh, panel. So how I ended up in infrastructure first. Very traditional academic background. Engineer working for a regulated utility operating infrastructure. And a quest to understand why we were operating infrastructure the way we were, why it got built there, that process to actually make that business model come to fruition was something very interesting to me. So I followed operations into business development to see what is the economic model that brought that infrastructure there in the first place. And looking at that business model, as you've observed today, I always felt there was something incongruent there. Why were we really building this large scale billion dollar asset? Why was this pipeline being put in there? And continuing to ask that question led us as a company down a path to explore. And as you start to explore, you start to learn that there is actually a very key difference in running a company that is focused on deploying capital than a company that is focused on dealing with customers. And I had an opportunity, and I feel very fortunate to do that, with a French parent company that had very high environmental altruistic goals to basically fund my idea. That if you could take energy infrastructure expertise and distribute it to everybody in a way that they want to engage. And they don't want to engage, as I said, in buying kilowatt hours. We had some discussion about people becoming virtual power plants. They don't want to be virtual power plants. They don't want to be batteries. They don't want to be called demand response. They want what we talked about, comfort, light, device functionality. And in that vernacular, in a very customer-facing vernacular, if we could deploy the insights of managing infrastructure in a distributed way, could we proliferate new value? So I still feel I'm an infrastructure guy, but it's just deploying infrastructure, I believe, in a more responsible way. I think the quote that um, you shared when we first talked was, uh, up until now, your company has made, uh, made its business focus in uh, creating value by building infrastructure. And now you've turned that equation around and you're creating value by eliminating the need for that infrastructure. And I thought that's a really compelling kind of vision um, that suggests a, really a different kind of phase of the economy uh, about where value could be created that I think we saw many hints of today. Um, I, this is a very compelling vision. I think one that a lot of our students are interested in. What do you see as the primary impediments to achieving that vision? Why can't we go there now? What, what do you run up against? Yeah. I'll answer that in, in two pillars. One's a very tactical pillar, one's a strategic pillar. The tactical pillar is legislation and regulation. We as a society are an infrastructure first society. We feel we can solve most problems, and historically we have, by building new or inventing new infrastructure to address things. We just talked a lot about battery. 
and when that cost of infrastructure will become, let's call it, grid parity. We've had very little discussion about, let's take one of our customers, which is a fast food chain. And every, most fast food restaurants, 30% of their square footage is a freezer. And we have these customers come in and say, we want to do a project to update our parking lot lighting to LED, our interior lighting to LED. And it might cost them $20,000 and save off-peak energy when actually wind turbines are blowing like crazy. And they don't talk today about how can we use that freezer as we discussed earlier. Why didn't that conversation happen today? Because we are an infrastructure first society. We want to tackle it with lithium ion. We don't want to tackle it with engaging with customers. Why? Because the energy industry doesn't know what a customer is still and doesn't know how to engage a customer. So that's the strategic impediment. We are not, as an industry, a design-first, outcome-based employee group. We don't think how to engage. We think that you were once a ratepayer, and now you are a consumer. And the latest buzzword is, yes, you're a customer. But are you really a customer? Because did you ever ask us for a kilowatt hour? And if you've never asked us for a kilowatt hour, how do we have a supplier-customer relationship? What is the job to be done? And the job to be done is not to give you kilowatt hours. That's the strategic impediment, is how do we as an industry shift our thinking? So what are some of the uh, ways that industry can step up to this challenge of helping people imagine what this future is? It seems like there's a big gap both in the industry and among those that you serve in imagining where these opportunities are and what the value of those might be. I, I believe it's firmly in narratives. And I gave you a few narratives. How do we create narratives that invigorate new passion around one of the most vital elements of society. And if we can gauge that new passion, we will understand better what electricity is actually worth. And I don't think society, we understand that. And I actually feel that the cents per kilowatt hour, if we go to that metric, is way too low. But the cost you pay is way too high. How can that coexist? It coexists because we don't really know what it's worth because we don't buy the kilowatt. We buy the outcome. And if you think about it, let's talk a little bit about economics. We're in a very good forum for that. We don't know what the demand curve is for energy. We only know the supply curve. We know the supply stack, what each incremental kilowatt cost, if it's generated from nuclear, coal, wind, solar, gas, and then we superimpose on that supply curve what society needs in terms of energy and says, OK, they crossed, and that's what it, you should pay for it. We don't really know what it's worth. What is it worth when you're really hot and you step into that nice air conditioning, or you're really cold and you step into a warm room? What is water worth when you're in the grocery store versus where you're at the amusement park? We've already been able, as a society, to figure that out, but not energy. And I think we have to figure out what energy is really worth. Quick analogy. People would call, call me crazy if I go back to the airport here in Raleigh-Durham, walk in, go up to one of the shuttle buses that the airport owns, 
stick some tubing into the gas tank and start siphoning gas out of that tank. I'd say, you're crazy. What are you doing? But nobody would look at me twice if I walk into the terminal and plug in my iPhone. I'm taking their energy either way. But we look at electricity so differently as a form of energy than we should. So I, this raises a question for me about um, how you think about the rapidly developing emerging markets and the vision of infrastructure or of energy services we should have in those markets. Uh, is your strategy particular to a market like North America that's experiencing kind of this um, you know, uh, flattening of demand that these services will be highly valued? Or does it also translate in places that have you know, real energy poverty that they're trying to achieve, a real focus on building out infrastructure? How would you translate some of the principles that you're talking about here into an emerging mar market context? Yeah. The one benefit we have in the United States is that the energy revolution, as NG would define it, will happen and grow here and be proliferated globally. We have very different tactical maneuvers around energy based on the economy we're serving. Very different play in Brazil, in Australia, in Asia, Europe than we have in the US. But the one fundamental belief we have is given the diversity of our markets, regulated, deregulated, and within deregulated markets, capacity markets, energy markets. Smart meters, no smart meters. Carbon legislation, not. RECs, no RECs. That diversity in the US and the entrepreneurial spirit of people pursuing different business models around energy will be leverageable globally in very different ways. In highly impoverished countries, it will be taking the rapid drop in cost curves in solar and storage and deploying it in a decentralized way. In other economies, like Mexico, creating increased emergence on the global scale, it will be more the forward thinking. And instead of building large scale infrastructure to match that of which we have in the United States, they might hopscotch elements of that. And our business model, where we learn from the US and deploy globally, will take the right elements to where different regions of the world are in their development cycle. Good. So I'm interested in your strategy around investment. Given that there is an existing grid, an existing system that we can't just uh, sort of completely leave behind, how do you think about the investment in the existing system that we have at the same time at diverting res resources toward building the system for the future? And you've, you've taken a pretty bold approach to that in your own business, but how do you think about sustaining that balance or being ambidextrous, as some of the scholars would talk about? Right. So I want to state up front, I believe wholeheartedly that our grid is an amazing construct for this country and all developed economies. And I think that the grid will be a significant competitive advantage for our economy for decades to come. And we have to keep investing in that grid, but also in models that utilize it in a different way than we do today. We heard in the last panel a comment when the question was asked about CCAs in California. And the answer was, people use our grid to source electricity from somebody else. And I wanted to ask the question, what did he mean by our? And I believe I know what he meant by our. He meant Southern California Edison's grid. I believe our grid is like our highway. It's your grid. And how can we use that grid 
to make us all more efficient so that when you need extra range on your electric car or more cooling capacity because you're having a party in the evening in your freezer, not a party in your freezer, but you need <laughs> cooling for that freezer, that we can co-optimize with each other. And I feel the grid will be like rail was when they said over-the-road transportation will make it obsolete. Over-the-road transportation did not make the rail system obsolete. It made it more efficient and more prolific and a key value proposition for our economy. The three Ds, digitization, decentralization, decarbonization, will not, in my mind's eye, make the grid obsolete. But it will force the grid to look at different value propositions for society. Great. I'm wondering what um, risks you see with the model that you're proposing. What keeps you up at night? Where, where do you see potential threats to the model that you're proposing? I feel that it's with the collective narrative. What we talk about just now is something that is very far reaching to most. Here in this room, we have a very solid grasp of what we would call energy companies. Whether that energy company be a solar developer, wind developer, IPP, utility. And we have a very firm grasp on what demand response is. We've even talked about frequency response and voltage control. That might be a little bit further to left, but we understand that. Society has been conditioned around one concept, a unit rate for electricity and what it costs. And can we gain society's trust moving into those new narratives is going to be key because we conditioned them to the opposite. So that's number one. Number two is do we have the right regulatory constructs to get to that next layer of efficiency? And I worry about state level versus federal level rights. Many industries you can talk to, that's an impediment, and it's an impediment in our industry. What I mean by that, when we were an infrastructure company operating power plants, we could create scalable business models because the federal government set the rules of the game by which we operate. When you engage customers, you dive very quickly into consumer protection, which is state level mandates. Creating scalable business models in the balkanized area of state level legislation and regulation is more than difficult. And I worry, do we have the new mindset to tackle that equation of how do you create the new energy economy around state level mandates versus federal and scalable business models like we discussed today? Excellent. You know, you've obviously made a big transformation in your own thinking and in your own career, but you're now in a role where you have to bring the rest of your company with you. How have you approached the question of talent and workforce? You talked about this sort of um, cutting back on your staff and now rebuilding it. I'd be interested to hear a little bit more on your, your talent and workforce strategy and how you're enabling your organization to make this transition. Yep. So as you can imagine, uh, a company that spent the better part of two decades in, in North America pursuing infrastructure, that announcing to that organization that we are divesting the majority of our infrastructure brought into light a lot of questions. It was very easy to deal with those that went with the infrastructure. Good luck to you. You're going to a better place with a company that believes in it. The difficult part was the stayers. How do you translate what you knew into what we want to be? And who we kept 
were those that were closer to customers, our energy retail business, those that understood how the grid operate, our energy traders, and creating narratives for them around how they can take their skill set that they used to deploy to infrastructure, but deploy it in a distributed way. Take an energy trader. Maybe you know or don't know that what they do on a daily basis is not only just buy on-peak and off-peak electricity, but they trade in call options, put options, straddles, financial derivatives that are basically operating our grid today no different than a battery or solar resource could tomorrow. So instead of trading call options with Morgan Stanley and Bank of America, can you create the virtual call option out of Dan's freezer? So we had to do that for the stayers. And then what's really great are the newcomers. Going after those new businesses with this message of what our vision is, how they fit into that strategy, and the invigoration they apply to the overall business. Good, so I'm intrigued by this idea of the new energy customer. Do they think more about energy or less in the vision that you have? Yeah. I love all the sayings, and, and uh, I've heard nine minutes today, I heard four minutes. <laughs> four minutes, yeah. <laughs> uh, that people think about electricity four minutes, I don't know, was it a month or a year that was said today? Yeah. Um, I actually feel, let's say it's four minutes a year. That's too much. I don't believe you should ever think about kilowatt hours. You shouldn't think about the price you're paying for those kilowatt hours. We need to focus, all of you, on the outcome. What is electricity worth to you in what you do with it? So I prefer a future model where you evaluate, do you want your home to be at 72 degrees or at 73 degrees? Because if you're in a warm climate, 73 might be $30 less a month than 72. I want you to think about how much range you need in your electric car during the week versus the weekend. So that when you go to the Tesla store and try to decide between the P80, P90, or the P100 with ludicrous mode, you know that maybe that ludicrous mode actually lowers your energy bill because that extra storage that you don't really need unless you want to impress your date or your wife or your kids, can be used to optimize the grid. So I want you to think about the outcome. Transportation, light, heat, not four minutes a year or eight minutes a year on electricity. Excellent. Well, we have about 10 more minutes, and I have many, many questions here. All of you are um, thinking of lots of ways to build on this conversation. Let me just ask uh, uh, two related questions. One is, uh, what your approach has been to rapidly integrate the new acquisitions that you have? And especially, how do you then wrap that up into a simple and compelling consumer proposition? So you have additional complexity um, in your business, and yet you need to simplify the message to your, uh, your, your customers or your, uh, your end users, how, whatever language you would like to use on that. How, how have you uh, managed that process? So on integration, two, again, I'll use the word strategic and tactical. Tactical move number one, investing in infrastructure is not an employee-centric business necessarily. Five people around the table making the right investment decisions mm -hmm can cause your company to prosper or not. When you don't use capital to leverage value, but rather services to leverage value, it becomes very quickly a people, employee-centric business. So tactical move number one, focus on human resources. Get the right employee-centric team in place, not an operational-centric, or infrastructure-centric team in place. Two, since it revolves around individual employee value propositions to create wealth and growth, again, I use the word narratives often. Create the right narratives so they can connect their daily job as it exists today 
with the vision, mission, and values that you have for the future. So I think it's two key areas. Become hyper-employee-centric. Amplify vision, mission, values in order to become, the second part of your question, hyper-customer-centric. Delivering to customers what they really want. I guess the next question is more about your um, kind of organizational transformation uh, activities. You've been able to make this transition faster than lots of peer organizations. What have you done or what's unique about NG that's allowed you to maybe move faster than other organizations that are in your space? So I, I have a very unique benefit. Uh, I run a part of NG that is only a fraction of it. NG is a very large international company. $40 billion market cap. As I mentioned previously, 110,000 megawatts. If we go back to Brad's initial presentation, that's about 10% of the generation in the United States, slightly less than 10% of the market cap of the utilities that he mentioned. My business is just under 10% of NG. And the benefit I have is that it's a bite-sized bet in a very self-contained, phenomenal petri dish of North America. And being able to leverage the amount of rope that they're giving me to either create something or hang myself, I don't know yet, <laughs> uh, is a luxury that most don't have. And I mentioned the bold moves we make, selling our power generation, building a war chest to invest. In the context of Engie, it's not such a big deal. So that's uh, the truth of why we can be more bold in this territory than most. Good. Um, there's a question about renewables. Given your focus on energy as a service, how does renewables fit into that vision? Because in some way, you could imagine that customers don't care where their energy comes from, or do they? How do you think about the role of renewables in an energy as a service kind of business model? So I didn't mention renewables much, because I feel that we as a society need to really focus on the decentralization and digitization, those new narratives. But I firmly believe there's a decarbonization element to our strategy, and that renewables are a prolific source for that. How do the two fit together? We do invest in wind generation. We have a wind power company. We do invest in solar grid scale generation. We have a battery company, grid scale and behind the meter. How do they fit in? Well, if we can achieve what we talked about earlier with high customer engagement around outcomes. Think about how much more renewable, non-dispatchable generation we could bring to the grid than we are today. In a lower environmental outcome, negative environmental outcome environment. Bringing the right solution at the right time. Maybe it's battery. Maybe it's thermal load management. But either one can help bring more renewable generation to the grid and repower the generation that exists today. So firm believer in it. So you talked before about one of the primary impediments being policy and regulatory structures that you need to operate in. What do you um, see as the role or the, the method that companies like yours can play in helping to facilitate the kind of transformation in the way that policymakers think about this space to allow some of these changes to happen. It, it talks just like this. Public utility commissions are very similar to our industry. They are brought up in a infrastructure first environment. And can those public utility commissions imagine new narratives? in order to create new policy. Just take smart meters as an example. A phenomenal amount of smart meter rollout programs around the nation. 
but the majority of the rationale for those are infrastructure-centered rationales, preventing the need to roll a truck to read a meter, using that meter to know where outages are occurring. Very few policy initiatives focus on the ability to lever the data for new outcomes. And if you look at any smart meter rollout program, and I feel that the most forward-thinking one in the nation right now happens to be Texas, but if you look at that one, it is not designed correctly to deliver outcomes of the future. How so? That smart meter data is accessible, but it's only accessible by you, the customer. And do you really want to register online to get a flat file sent to you that is 50,000 lines of five minute interval data for you to deliver a new outcome around energy for yourself? No, you don't. It was never designed to integrate with many of the things we talked about today in order to deliver the outcomes of the future. And that's where we need to engage our story with regulators and legislators to think differently about the things we can do given technology and consumer mindsets. I guess we'd burn through our four minutes a year pretty fast if we had to look through that flat file. We, you would. Yeah. <laughs> um, was there an element of kind of uh, scenario planning and assumptions around carbon pricing in your parent company or in, in your unit as you thought about this strategy? How, how uh, sort of um, related is your understanding of where that world of carbon pricing might go to the strategy that you're promoting? Yeah, you have to just take a fundamental bet. And whether it's carbon pricing, whether it's renewable energy credits, whether it's net metering for solar, those all have the same tailwind. A substantially different environmental impact than we have today. So yes, we used to focus on what would our business model look like if carbon was $20 a ton versus $50 a ton versus no legislation around it? What happens if PTCs are there or not? Renewable energy credits, there or not? We ultimately threw that out and said, there's a secular bet to be made. Society will figure out a way to promote cleaner, more cost-effective, ways to power itself. And whatever the mechanism it is, our business strategy should thrive. Good, so I have time for one more question, and a quick one, but not a simple one. What's your advice for the university and for these students to help facilitate the kind of transition that you're talking about? Yeah, so I think everybody got asked that question. And, uh, so all the good answers have yeah. been taken, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll answer it differently. I, I, it, it's a little bit odd. But my advice is think like a comedian. Why? The one thing I admire about comedians is their innate ability to take something incongruent on the fly and make you laugh. That, to me, is the art of, con of, of comedy. Why do I say think like a comedian? In business, you will create phenomenal value if you can quickly identify what is incongruent and amplify it. So my advice, think like a comedian. Great, so guys, go out and get your clown suits and take over the industry. Thank you, Cyan, very much for a fantastic presentation.